Okay, so Maddox, thanks for joining us today. Today we have Stephen David Brooks. He's a director and a recovering VFX supervisor who's turned into a, a multi-award winning feature writer, director, and also a music video director. So let's welcome him to the show and he's gonna just tell us all kind of great things. And I want everyone to know he is known for Heads and Tails and Flytrap. So let's welcome Stephen to the show. Hi, Stephen. Hi, does this just mean I'm a film addict now? Oh, great, great. We have amazing, amazing listeners all around the world. Thank you, listeners. And so, uh, Stephen, can you let everyone know where you're re recording live with me today? Yes, I know. Oh, you mean where am I? Yeah. At the moment, or? Yeah. Uh, I'm in beautiful downtown Woodland Hills, California. Okay, so you're in Los Angeles, Woodland Hills, by the Kardashians, yes. right? <laughs> I see them all the time at Trader Joe's, yes. <laughs> Uh-oh. Actually, actually, I see Fabio at Trader Joe's, weirdly enough. <laughs> Uh-oh, -uh. Trader Joe's is going to be stocked now. <laughs> yeah, I used to see him at Whole Foods, but he must be in must be some hard times because now he's at Trader Joe's. Uh, hey, Trader Joe's is awesome. They have the best snacks in the world. I love them. They're not a sponsor, <laughs> but they have the best snack station ever so um so steven i'm gonna ask you growing up what was one of your favorite movies that you loved as a kid uh boy well the first movie that really blew me away as a kid when my parents started to let me watch movies in theaters was 2001 a space odyssey i was very young when i saw it on the big screen i didn't understand it I'm not sure i understand it now <laughs> but it but it gave me the sense of the power of cinema, the power of imagery. Well, that movie, yeah, has the best images ever. So that's your favorite film as a kid? You sure not as like a more of a doll? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I had a number of, you know, there was always a film on TV that played a lot, of, a film from 1946, 47, called The Best Years of Our Lives, which is about a group of uh soldiers and a sailor who returned home from World War II to their small town in Iowa. And my father, who was in World War II, said it was the perfect film of what it's like as a veteran to return home from war. So that always, it had a lasting impact. I mean, it's a great film, but also because my father would, anytime it was on TV, he would watch it. I would watch it with him. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, uh, thank you for your father for, um, fighting for our country. My dad was a pilot in the Navy. So I love anyone who's a vet or there's movies with vets. And so it's really important to take care of our vets who, who give us our free speech and freedom. So yeah, that's great. And it's always nice when your father or a family member, someone that you love introduces you to a film because then you, then you have these treasured memories when you watch it. Like, oh, I used to watch it with my dad or my mom or my grandpa. And it's like, it brings all those great feelings back from your childhood. So that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I still, when it's on TCM occasionally, I catch it, I still watch it. Yeah. And so I'm going to ask you, since you're a director and you're a writer, so um, did you have a favorite Criterion movie that perhaps inspired you to go into your film, film path? Uh, well, it's, it's, I mean, the Criterion came along later, but my favorite, by far my favorite Criterion film is... Wings of Desire, which Vim Vendor's films, a beautiful black and white and color restoration of it on Criterion. And that's another one, of course, I own. I own the DVD, then I own the, the, the HD version. Um, it's just a great, very esoteric European film that I just love it. And I refer back to it all the time. Oh, can you share a little bit with, because uh, sometimes we have new, newer yeah. audience or up and coming, yeah. they might be younger. We have different generations listening. And um, right. can you tell, share a little bit? Oh, is it, yes. it's a fantasy, right? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, there was an American remake. Oh, we lost a little bit um, of connection. So he was saying there's American version and American remake. So let me just see, Stephen, do we have you? Yes, hello. Okay, perfect. So you were saying it yes. was um, the American no. version, the remake? There's an Amer yes, there was an American remake called City of Angels with Nicolas Cage, which didn't do justice to the original. The original, it's very German, very dour, kind of serious, cerebral and philosophical about an angel 
who's looking down on the humans below and he passes other angels as they're looking after their wards, you know, humans who don't see them obviously because they're guardian angels. And he falls in love with this circus performer, this trapeze artist, this woman, and he wants to become human because he sees her struggle and her suffering and realizes even with the strife that we humans go through, there's something valuable about being human, about experiencing life. And for me, that's just a beautiful metaphor for our journey. Yeah, that sounds um, very stunning. I have to rewatch that. I haven't seen that in a while. But yeah, those films just capture your heart in the, the beauty and the story and the acting and just the direction. So I'm going to ask you, since you're a director, um, do you have a favorite director? And can you share us with us a favorite film shot? Boy, it, it's hard. I mean, I, I always say Stanley Kubrick only oh, yeah. because I discovered him so early. And you look at one frame of any of his films and you go, oh, that's Stanley Kubrick. He puts his stamp on everything. But I have other directors I love. I just finished the biography of Mike Nichols, a um, wonderful new biography about him. And Mike Nichols, I sort of patterned myself after Mike Nichols, um, not intentionally, but the fact that he changes his style, he can go from Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, this stark black and white drama to The Graduate, which has a lighter tone, coming of age kind of story uh, to it, to The Birdcage. I mean, he was able to just change his style film to film to film, but yet they were all Mike Nichols films. And what the hallmark of a Mike Nichols film is, it has a sense of humor, even who's a friend of Virginia Woolf has some humor, very sick humor, but humor. And he's brilliant with actors. He's, He's brilliant at getting the actors to take what's on the page and tell the story. Yeah, and could you share with us a little bit? Could I, I, I want to go back to Stanley Kubrick because you were you you know you shared with me. So I want our audience yeah. um, this uh, Stanley Kubrick signature wide. It's 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 called the wide right wide angle zero point perspective shot. Right. Yes. It's a if you look up zero point perspective. Um, you will probably find images of Stanley Kubrick movies. And what that is, is, for example, there's a thing called a vanishing point. Um, it's something painters are taught that if you stand outside and you look to the horizon, let's say there's a street in front of you, or you look down a hallway in a house, the, the, the width of the hallway seems to get narrower as it gets farther away from you. And if that hallway was 10 miles long, it would disappear into a single point. If you, like a long roadway will do that, you know, or a row of uh, wheat in a, in a field will do that. That's the, just the way that I perceive things. That's the perspective. That's called the vanishing point, that point where all the lines in that image intersect. So in photography, you can exaggerate that effect with a wide angle lens. So Stanley Kubrick, for example, in The Shining with the Steadicam shot following the big wheel down the hallway of the Overlook Hotel, he's using a wide lens. So the, the hallway looks longer than it normally would. And he has the camera directly behind. And then the coverage is directly in front of the kid on the big wheel. It's not to the side, it's not at a 45 degree angle, directly behind and directly in front. And this directness does two things. When you're directly behind someone, there's a sense of foreboding, like you're sneaking up on them. And when the camera is directly in front of them, it's a very intimate shot. You as an audience are there with that kid in the hallway. And he uses that to great effect. He uses it in all his films. He uses it in 2001. He uses it in Clockwork Orange. He uses it. He's, he's always used it. Oh, I love how you explain that. Oh, that's amazing. Thanks so much for sharing that. And so, um, can, okay, so you and I, I think we have like the same humor. Uh, can you share, because you also write, and, um, we always love it when people tell us their favorite lines from a movie, but can you share your favorite line from The Pink Panther with us? Oh, yes. It's, just, it's, a, it's such a great joke. I still laugh. I'm laughing now thinking about it. Um, and this is from the original with 
Peter Sellers, not the remake, but Steve Martin. They may have used it in the remake. I don't know. I, don't, I didn't see the remake. And Inspector Clouseau, who's this bumbling French detective, um, is walks up to a man sitting on the uh, uh, like a a bench, I think it is, in a park in Paris, and there's a dog next to that man. And Inspector Clouseau says, says, does your dog bite? And the man says, no. So Inspector Clouseau reaches to pet the dog, and the dog bites him. (laughs) Inspector Clouseau says, I thought you said your dog does not bite. And the man says, well, it is not my dog. (laughs) I love the Pink Panther movies. Everything from the actor to the writing, the comedy yep. to the music. And they have everything. The best. The best and, ever. And it's actually a funny thing. The first one, the Pink Panther, David Niven was the star. Inspector Clouseau was a minor character. And Blake Edwards, the director, said, oh, my God, Peter Sellers is so brilliant. He kept adding scenes to make him, Inspector Clouseau, Peter Sellers, the star. So if you look at that movie, there are a bunch of scenes with Inspector Clouseau that have nothing to do with the story. <laughs> they just did scenes with him to have more of him in the movie. Then, of course, the sequels became about him. That's amazing how when you just shine on camera that someone can recognize that. So yeah. uh, I'm going to ask you how you discovered your path to be a writer-director. So um, like when you were a kid, like how did you know you were going to be a director? And can you just share with us a little bit like how you yeah. started? And where did you grow I, up? Uh, I grew up in Northern California, San Jose, uh, technically Campbell. is right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, and I got my dad, used my dad's eight millimeter movie camera and just started shooting. I started imitating Stanley Kubrick shots as best I could with an eight millimeter camera. Um, I discovered, discovered writing at UCLA. I went to film school, um, studied under the brilliant Richard Walter, who has taught a lot of great screenwriters. Um, I'm not saying I'm a great screenwriter, but I'm saying he taught a lot of great screenwriters. And sort of taking my, I was always telling stories, but learning the craft of how to tell it cinematically on the page, it took me about 10 years before I actually made money doing it. So I I was writing in the evenings um, in my spare time and any day I had off, and I sort of fell into visual effects as my day job, which is how I ended up uh, under the tutelage of this guy named John Dykstra, who supervised the effects for Star Wars, won an Oscar for that, won an Oscar for Spider-Man 2. He had a company called Apogee. And I sort of worked my way up from a driver to visual effects supervisor. Um, and one day, uh, John had worked with Toby Hooper, the director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and, you know, Poltergeist, uh, had worked with Toby on a couple of films. And Toby had another movie coming up called Spontaneous Combustion, wanted John Dykes to do the effects. John was not available. And John said, Steve, go to Beverly Hills. Go talk to Toby. So I drove up to Toby Hooper's house, sat across from him. I happened to have a reel of fire footage I had shot on a film in Canada. And as it turns out, the film he was looking for visual effects for was called Spontaneous Combustion. It was all about fire. So I got the job. Oh my gosh, that's like spontaneous. Well, well that's also the right, that's the luck aspect of the film business, right? You have to be prepared, but there needs to be a moment of luck, right place at the right time. And I was at the right place at the right time. So I did the effects for Toby. Um, I did a little cameo in the movie, which was awful. They cut me out. Uh, I directed <laughs> oh. second unit. I directed second unit. And the first professional actors I had to direct were two Oscar nominees, Melinda Dillon, who was nominated for Close Encounters, and Brad Dourif, who was nominated for One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest and I think Wise Blood. Um, Wow. So no pressure there. Um, Anyway, after that film, I went on. I was a visual effects supervisor. And uh, the reason I call myself a recovering visual effects supervisors that it's such a traumatic experience <laughs> I, I never got over it anyway i was at disney i had finished dick tracy or i had finished another film called wild and apom and i'm on the stage and i get a call from toby I hadn't heard from him in a couple of years and he asked me if i've ever written horror i said yes which was a lie i had not <laughs> and he said pick up a copy of Night Shift, which is a Stephen King short story, and come up to my house and tell me how you'd adapt it into a movie. 
So I bought a copy of Night Shift. I sat outside his home, read like it's like a five or six page short story, all told in flashback, no third act in a cinematic sense. And I had to pitch this to Toby. And I go in to pitch it to him. And I find out that not only am I pitching him, I'm pitching Stephen King. Because Stephen King has script approval. Oh, my God. So I pitched Toby. He said, oh, man, that's far out. I'm going to call Steve King. I'll call you tomorrow morning. I said, okay. 10 a.m. next morning, to- 10 a.m. next morning, Toby called, said, we're going to pay you $1,500 to re- can you write a draft in 10 days. I said, of course I said yes. I uh, didn't sleep for 10 days. I wrote a terrible draft. Stephen King loved it. And then I found out that that was just an audition that a lot of major screenwriters in Hollywood had taken a crack at this adaptation. Stephen King rejected all of them, but loved what I did for some reason. So 44 drafts later and more money, uh, we were in South Africa shooting the movie. I was the writer, visual effects supervisor, second unit director. Oh, wow. That's and that's how I became a professional writer. Oh, so I just want to recap a little bit because um, I, I want everyone to know that you you had a series of day jobs and your first professional gig is you you worked as a PA for uh, Robbie Lance, who's a legendary agent. Could you just share yes. with us a little bit how it was working for Robbie yeah. Lance? Like who who was his uh, clients? Can you share with us a little bit about Yes, that? Robbie, Robbie. Oh, absolutely. So. And what's funny is I find out reading the Mike Nichols biography to backtrack a bit that the agent that got Mike Nichols to become a film director, he was a successful Broadway director who got him his first film gigs, one, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and The Graduate, was Robbie Lance. And he never mentioned that to me, Robbie Lance. Anyway, Robbie's a legendary agent. At the time, he represented uh, – and I met most of these people, Jeremy Irons, Sam Neill. Helen Mirren, Betty Davis, Elizabeth Taylor. I never met Elizabeth Taylor. Raquel Welch. I met Raquel Welch. Um, Peter Schaffer, the playwright of Amadeus. In fact, the Amadeus film was Robbie Lance getting Milo Schwarman, who's a client, to go see Amadeus, the stage play on the West End in London when it first opened, and said, don't you think this would make a great movie? And Milo Schwarman said, yeah. So that whole thing was a Robbie Lance package, that entire film. Wow. Um, what was a memorable so moment? I, I, have a signed, I have the signed collection of Peter Schaffer plays, signed by Peter Schaffer himself. So. Oh. Can you tell us some, like, memorable moments when someone walked into cool. the uh, office that just blew you away? Like, like who blew you um, away when they walked in? Um, yes. Well, there, there was a wonderful moment. Um, there's an actor named Roy Dotrice, who actually – only passed away recently, British actor. He played uh, Mozart's father in Amadeus. He was a Lance office client. And he was so grateful for that part. He came into the office in a freshly, uh, a new suit with an ascot. He was very British, very eccentric. Pulled out of his wallet fresh $100 bills and gave everybody a $100 bill to thank us all for the work. I love so that. So was, that was wild. Now, I know, he's so classy. Uh, the, the craziest one is um, when Betty Davis was in town, she stayed in this townhouse. Uh, she had like a, a condo um, on Havenhurst off of Sunset. And I would deliver scripts to her and her assistant, Catherine Cermak, who wrote a great biography of Miss Davis, by the way. Um, Catherine would come to the door, I'd give her a script. That was it. One day I showed up at three minutes after five, the door opened, and it was Betty Davis. Oh, wow. And, and, and because most, most of her films were black and white, people, no one realizes how intense her blue eyes are. Um, she was wearing an L.A. Dodgers jersey, an L.A. Dodgers cap, kind of crooked to one side. She had a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other. And she just looked at me and said, well. <laughs> and I just said, I don't know what I said to Ms. Davis. Oh, I have it from, you know, Mr. Lance. Here, here, here's a script. And she goes, oh, she took the script, went inside, came back with a handful of change to try to tip me. And I said, Ms. Davis, you don't have to tip me. I work for Mr. Lance. And she said, oh, I didn't mean to offend you. Okay, you didn't offend me. And she goes, do you want to come in for a drink? 
And I said, I can't, I'm still working. She goes, let me, let me take care of that. So I went in, sat in her library where she had her two Oscars, party photos of her with Humphrey Bogart and all these people like this. Those are her party snaps, right? She picks up the phone to call the Lance office and say, all she said is, yes, it's me. Stephen will not be coming back to the office today. He's having a drink with me. Goodbye. And she hung up. So from then on, the orders were, every time I used to deliver a script, it would be after five, because five was cocktail hour. She actually had that in her contracts. I was to show up after five, and that was the end of my work day. I was to stay for drinks. And she just, well, could she drink? Wow. Um, but she told me just stories and stories and stories and she finally said, so what is it you want to do? And I said, I want to be a director. She goes, well, then why are you working for an agency? You should quit and pursue directing. And I thought, you know what? She's right. I left. The next morning, I gave my notice. And about a half hour after that, the phone rings. And I hear the assistant say, Miss Davis on line two. She called to say, I hear Stephen is leaving. He must come say goodbye to me on his last day. Now, I didn't tell her I was definitely quitting. I didn't call and say, I just quit, or I gave my notice. She just knew I wouldn't. If she said, you have to quit, she knew I couldn't <laughs> not do it. You know, she was, she was the most powerful human being I have ever met in my life, all five foot one of her. And I've met a lot of movie stars and powerful people over the years. No one comes close to her. No one. Wow. Um, so anyway, I went that last Friday and she dressed up and she had a drink and uh, she gave me a signed photo, which I have. If we we're on a computer, you would see it. It's on the wall behind me uh, at my desk because she's always looking over my shoulder. And uh, talking about guardian angels, right? And also she gave me an ashtray, this hand painted ashtray. And she said, and I'll never forget this. She goes, I still get choked up when I think of it. She goes, Fellini gave this to me in Cannes in 1956. I want you to have it from one director to another. I want to cry. He's my favorite. I, He's my favorite I director. In a, a I, I, can send, I can send you a photo of both of the, of the ashtrays. So the ashtray is on my desk um, oh. and to always remind me of her. So that's in terms of people I met, that was the pinnacle. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I hope if you ever need a, a, an AD, because I'm aspiring uh, director myself, you know, it's hard for girls to have a chance. If you ever need one, please think of me. But I just wanted to share okay. that amazing story with our audience. I hope that they appreciate this beautiful story, how like your passion and like, you know, how we we all start. I started in the mailroom and I'm still I'm still working my tail off. I haven't made my break. Oh, oh Stephen, I have like um, it's a, it's a really great day for me. I hit three number ones with my kids' podcast and chanting book readings today. So I just want to thank our audiences for nice. listening. Yeah, and we hit big rankings, um, big ratings today with Film Addicts as well all over the world, especially Italy. We hit number four in Italy, which is I was born in Italy. So thank you for listening, everyone. I'm glad y'all enjoying the show. Jo enjoying the show so I can keep bringing you guys amazing directors and filmmakers to talk to you and just tell you their journey. And I also wanted to say that like you, you were driving, like you were driving for the Oscar winning, The I don't think they understood that you were his driver for John Dystra. And you know, the thing- Well, well, well not his personal driver. I mean, I was a driver for Apogee, his company, okay. just delivering, yes, I wasn't like his chauffeur. Oh, but I was okay. a driver at his company, yes. But still driving around and stuff like that. Like you were like pre yes. Amazon, <laughs> pre Uber, or pre Lyft, right? <laughs> so, but like, but it takes meeting those people. And you also said the luck because the more that I interview people, and I've interviewed now over over eighty filmmakers and directors and everyone, and and luck seems to be very key. If you weren't born into the business, let's face yeah. it, if you're born into the business, so I guess that's lucky. You were, you, you just were lucky to right. be born. But if you weren't born into the business, then there seems like there needs to be this certain amount of luck element because there's only so many people that can, you know, it seems like, you know, like with all the actors in the world, they use the same ones over and over again, because I guess it's just easier to use the same people, you know, but the, um, so, yeah. so it's just amazing your career. So um, let me just see what time it is. Let's see if I want to go to part two, if we can continue. 
Um, do you wanna wanna keep going and try to? And yeah, let's, I think let's, we're let's keep going. I, I think we're gonna do two parts. So, cause I want everyone to know all the work that you've done. Cause it's uh, twenty five minutes. Do you wanna like um tell them to come back for part two? No, let's go for it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so then can you just share with us? I mean, a COVID was off. So you started directing. Can you share with us after writing for Stephen Frickin' King? He had the pick of the litter. And you just like yeah. said, no, uh, yeah, of course I wrote uh, horror. And you end up getting picked for the Stephen King. And then where did you shoot again? You said you went off to which country? South Africa. We South tried in South Africa because the money came from South Africa. Oh, hey, we're number four in Kenya. Thank you, Kenya. Thank you, South Africa, for listening. So, uh, yeah, hey, that's a good story. So uh, maybe they have a film for you to do. So uh, so you were second unit director. Can you share with us how you went from, you know, from second unit to your big, uh, your first directing um, feature? Yes. Yes. Well, because I also, after the, the Mangler, which was the Stephen King film, um, I started doing a thing where I'd write, direct, supervise visual effects. They, they would pay me for two and get three, but I did it just so I could get the second year director credit. And these were lower budget movies where second year director oftentimes meant working with the principal actors finishing a scene. Normal second unit is just car drive-bys or stunts, even though I did that as well. Um, but the, the companies I worked for kept dangling the carrot saying direct second unit one more time, we'll let you direct a movie, you know? And they kept saying that, kept saying that, and it never happened. So in early 2002, I found a guy, because I, I wanted my debut to be this really acerbic crime comedy called Heads and Tails, which was budgeted at $5 million. Uh, and I found a guy in Australia who had $20,000 and a camera and 90,000 feet of film and said, can you make it for that? I'll give you the camera and the film. I said, yes. So I had to rewrite the script down from $5 million to, you know, $50,000. Um, Incredible. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It, the past. So I, I know. So luckily, I had a lot of actors. I cast it mostly with actor friends. Uh, my producer, Scott Putman, thank God his wife at the time was Shana Landsberg well-known casting director who filled out the other roles. And we scouted locations and planned to shoot. And Scott said, you know, we should reserve a camera and some film just in case this guy, your investor's late. I said, that's a good idea. Well, as you can imagine, the investor never sent the money and or the camera or the film stock. Oh. Halfway, halfway, halfway through shooting, the two-week shoot, the investor calls and said, okay, I'm ready to send the camera and the film. I go, I'm already shooting. Forget it. So I made the film on credit cards. I was, I was going to the bank, cashing credit card checks, you know, adv cash advance checks to pay the crew. Holy cow, Batman. Um, <laughs> but I got it made. Um, I learned how to edit Avid to edit it. We, you know, hired professional sound people who do the sound. Um, and then I thought, oh, now I have to explore film festivals. I wonder how that works. Like everyone, who gets to that point, they think, well, you submit your film, it's great, everyone's gonna love it, you'll win can. Well, it doesn't work that way. The film festival world is not like that at all. Um, See, Steven, let's, let's just end here because um, it, we're already, I, I wanna invite the audience back. Uh, please come back for a part two with Steven David Brooks, who, who uh, drinks cocktails with the legendary Betty Davis. So let's hear how his journey to his first feature film on credit cards. So please come back for part two with Steven David Brooks. Uh, please come back audience. Thank you so much.